Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sharper than a serpent's tooth, it is to have an unthankful child. This is King Lear. In probably one of the greatest works of literature in the entire English language, some people hold King Lear to be not only Shakespeare's greatest work, the apex of the English language. And in this line, old ancient King Lear from ancient Britain tells us the facts. He not only has an ungrateful child, he has two. And those two daughters would wreak ruin on him and his kingdom. He does have a third daughter, Cordelia. She will prove herself to be the good one. She's the grateful one. She can't be broken by the need to claw her way into her father's good mercies, which is, of course, the inheritance, which is the kingdom itself. She doesn't want that. She doesn't need it. And despite everything else in this great play, she stays loyal to her father and will suffer. And she will predecease her father. And in one of the great scenes, I mean a great dramatic scenes of all scenes, in the end, the malefactors who are destroying Lear step by step by step, inch by inch, click, click, click of the clock, they kill her. And in the end, he presents her again on stage and he says, oh, you are men of stones. It's one of the great lines. And then he dies. Such is the way it is with tragedy, that the, the death of Lear, the death of Cordelia, his faithful daughter, and the beginning of the tragedy, which is set into motion actually by Lear himself, and it's set into motion with this wonderful line about sharp-toothed serpents and unthankful children. Well, what happened in the gospel today? Were there not ten lepers, the Lord says? Where are the other nine? This is one of the great problems. What happened to the nine lepers? Leprosy, leprosy being an, a disease that is not much seen anymore, not here in the United States, it does still exist. There are cures now. And what happens? A disease that would cause you to be separated from everyone in your society, which would make you the ultimate image, the icon of the outcast, the exile. And here, a group of them meet Jesus Christ. And the fact that it would be a group makes sense because lepers were quarantined. They were colonized into groupings simply to keep them away from everyone else. In the fashion, it was the ultimate COVID situation of which no mask could save you. And yet they encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the epiphany, the theophany of Jesus Christ comes over them. A miracle is worked. And it's a liturgical miracle because they're commanded to go and wash and present themselves to the official clergy. And so they come to, the, to a temple situation. They make an offering of themselves. All is good and well. And in the gospel, we have the account of one and only one who comes back to give thanks unto the Lord to the source of his healing. So what happened to the nine? We assume that they obeyed. They washed. We assume that they obeyed the command. They presented themselves. They made offering of themselves before the clergy. And then we hear no more about them. All we know is that the Lord's condemnation comes upon them. They become the thankless child, the sharp-toothed serpent. I'd like to speak on this for a moment because my concelebrant this morning, yesterday, on the Feast of St. Nicholas, I hope he doesn't get mad at me, I'm going to steal from him now, was preaching about the virtues of St. Nicholas. And he mentioned about a situation between two sisters where one gave a gift of great care and some beauty. Maybe not of great, too much expense, but at least some care and preparation and thoughtfulness went into the gift. And I urge you to go and listen to that sermon. 
because I want everybody to go to our webpage and partake of our offerings here rather than the, all the other junk that's available online. Go to our pages. And of course, you know, I have to preach brand loyalty. Naturally, you want to go to our pages above all others. And the one sister presented the gift. But the other sister returns a gift rather carelessly put together. As my concelebrant said, perhaps bought at the dollar store and not well wrapped and gave it. And then when the miserly sister opens her gift and realizes that it's a little more splendid, but it has more of the attributes of love, more of the trappings of care on it, he notes, and this is very common for human beings, she can either fall into repentance or, unfortunately, the other. And he quotes the other. She comes into bitterness and gets angry over the gift. And I'm wondering now if that's what happened to our nine lepers. Did they succumb to the curse of what I would call Satan's Christmas gift, which is bitterness and ingratitude? What causes a child to become thankless, bitter, and ungrateful? This is a very difficult question, and I can only touch on a couple of words this morning about it. We do know, scientifically, some of the causes of these conditions. It concerns something called executive functioning in children. Ancients knew about it, too, under different names, but something can go wrong in the formation of children before the age of 10, to where this executive function of knowing how to turn and be grateful and to give back, to be gracious as a part of well-matteredness, something can go haywire. And this ability can be not implanted in the child, not formed in the child. And the bad news is this, and by the way, if you think psychology is a life-giving science, think again. The current reigning opinion is that unless this capacity is installed early on, once you cross over the line into puberty, the reigning opinion is that you cannot acquire this function. You will not have it. You've seen this function in its absence before. How many of you have ever seen a person, you say to the person, John, please listen carefully. I'm going to tell you something and you cannot tell someone else. And then you tell John. And then you can set your clock by it. John has already told someone else. And he said, John, I told you not to tell someone. This was absolutely a must do, must keep secret. Oh, you're right, it was. I'll never do that again. And of course, you know, there will be another time when that will happen exactly that way again. That's actually a symptom of this loss of functioning. And you're banging your head against a wall if you're going to try to bring that person into the functioning. I've got more bad news for you. This function can be obliterated in a human being. The most common form to, of obliteration or extinction of the virtue of, function, of executive functioning is trauma. Extreme trauma can wipe out a certain amount of your executive functioning. So you can go from being a promise keeper to a, unable to keep a promise, a promise breaker. From a man or a woman of truthfulness and integrity to basically a gossip. And you lose the ability to say, oh self, I told myself not to do that, and I keep doing that. There's a certain degree of evidence that trauma actually is really, really destructive of our human life. I would offer to you that the lepers, because of their condition, they may have in fact had the kind of trauma that wiped out the executive functioning, which would have made them grateful and only the one was able to come back and demonstrate gratitude. That is possible for us. Those of you who are busy now raising children, I hope you will take this to heart. The preparation of the ground for the spiritual life and for the life of virtue is in your hands. It's your job to create and tend this place where this beautiful thing called executive functioning or virtuous functioning in older language takes hold. 
where the spiritual life takes hold. Lately, I've been listening to some talks on contemporary elders of the church. I will pass on to you one line in the raising of children, whether they be in the womb or already newborn, toddlers, infants, two-year-olds, and then off getting ready for school. The word is this. You have to create an atmosphere of love where there is a place of peacefulness, a garden where things are stable. That's the key word. Interesting that the elders, who are not psychologists in the contemporary sense, nailed it exactly what the psychologists say. Executive functioning is enabled by a state of peace and consistency in the house or the classroom or the church. Those of you who are involved in this, pay close attention to this because you're making it possible for someone to have a gift in the future. For those of us who have come under this and received the gift or for those of us who have also not had the gift and for those of us who have had trauma, prayer, there's a lot of evidence to say that prayer actually works to stabilize and repair and rebuild this gift in us to make us grateful. And on that, I would tell you, I think gratitude, blagodarnost, I believe it is in Russian, is such an important gift. And I will leave you with this. When you're grateful, you have to be grateful about something real and concrete. You cannot be grateful for the value of pi because we don't even have the value of pi for heaven's sakes. It's an unknown number to us in its final form. You cannot be grateful about Cantor's set theorem. Though it's beautiful, it's completely abstract. It doesn't cause the virtue of gratitude to come forth. You can't be grateful about even an abstract thing such as freedom. You can only really be grateful for freedom when it's in the concrete right in front of you, when your feet are on the ground. I think gratitude is an extremely concrete virtue. And what it does is it puts you right where you need to be and you can't argue against it. The concreteness of gratitude makes it authoritative. It does something else for us too. The moment your feet are on the ground, authoritatively, spiritually, in that place of peace where virtues come forth, it also opens us to divine love. And it's the divine love that restores us. It's the divine love, ultimately, I believe, that brought the tenth leper back to the Lord for a second blessing, for another level of gratitude and grace received. May it go that way for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.